now we just got to check in.
nuestro gatito, Educators 
and even George Washington himself doled out to young men in the generation after the uh, revolution. And a lot of this literature called for physical sacrifice, bodily sacrifice. And, uh, a, a, a young man um, in the early republic could get ahead um, and do well and be virtuous uh, by sacrificing physically on behalf of something bigger than himself, especially uh, sacrificing for the nation. So by early in life, Pike has persuaded himself that in order to pursue his ambitions, uh, the best way to do that was through discipline, uh, bodily service to the nation. And so that's why he uses words like fortitude. And that's why he thought when he, talk, when he uh, writes about Sparks and Nardi. And that's why he uh, believes that uh, uh, toes are an acceptable sacrifice to earn um, uh, uh, return to the bosom of a grateful um, country. So, uh, and that's also why in the fall of 1806, he uses a, uh, a metaphor, a physical sacrifice, spare no pains. Uh, the, uh, he says that I, I'm going to spare no pains in order to accomplish the objects of my mission, which as the he thought he was going to be back, he left in July, he thought he'd be back um, by December, um, it's now November, and the uh, nights are getting chilly and the days are getting short, the horses are tired, and the cottonwoods are turning bright amber in the bottomlands of the, the riverways of the Great Plains. And I was starting to wonder if he's going to be able to accomplish what he set out to do. And he says that uh, even if there's great pain and suffering along the way, he vows to stay committed uh, to that. But this raises the question of what were the objects of his mission. One possibility is that the objects were Jefferson's objects. Jefferson, of course, the third president of the United States, had recently purchased uh, or organized the purchase of this big chunk of land in the middle of the United States, of what would later become the rest of the United States, uh, Louisiana, in 1803. Now, you've probably seen maps like this one many times. They have very clear boundaries. It's obvious where America is, and it's obvious where the land is interesting. The land was only claimed by Spain. It wasn't really New Spain. It was only claimed by Spain. But anyway, um, and the Louisiana Purchase very well outlined. This describes the Louisiana Purchase in 1819, after its final boundaries were um, uh, negotiated. But it, at the time of the Louisiana Purchase, it was a lot messier. It looked more like this. This is an 1802 Spanish map of North America. And the thing I want you to pay attention to here is this little big blank spot in the map. That's Louisiana. Um, it was not clear what Louisiana contained. It was not clear at least to Spanish and American and British and French, French contestants from North America. Not clear what it contained, where its mountains, rivers, uh, and, uh, uh, and resource, resources, and things like that were. So who's going to win the contest for North America is going to be determined by who can get into this blank spot on the map and begin to settle it, tap its resources, map it, and make friends with the indigenous people who already inhabited it, who economically and militarily were extremely powerful. This is another way to depict, to depict Louisiana. This is from a modern textbook. This, oops, look. There we go. So, this light shaded area is the territory that Jefferson believed that he had purchased from the French. This dark shaded area is what the Spanish acknowledged he had purchased from the French. And you can see there's going to be trouble here. Okay. Um, so, uh, Meriwether Lewis, whom Pike knew, had told Pike that Jefferson planned to send several military expeditions to explore 
this contested and un, largely unknown territory and uh, suggested that Pike might be the leader of one of them. Lewis's famous expedition to the Pacific is, of course, the one that we remember both best, but there were several of them. So it was quite reasonable for Pike um, to imagine that his expedition uh, was one of Jefferson's other uh, expeditions. So, but although Jefferson knew about and approved of Pike's Western expeditions to the Rocky Mountains, it was not actually ordered by Jefferson the way Lewis's was. The man who ordered Pike's expedition was this man, James Wilkinson. And I'm going to sit ahead here for just a second. I'll come back to this slide. Um, Jeff, uh, Wilkinson was the ranking officer of the United States Army. At the time, he was the governor of the newly acquired Louisiana Territory. And he sent Pike out in July of 1806 from St. Louis to travel across Missouri and Kansas and uh, try to develop friendly relations with the Osage people who lived in this area, the Kaw Indians who lived around here, and the Pawnee who lived up here in southern Nebraska and northern Kansas. After that, Pike was supposed to travel south, which he did, and find the Arkansas River. And I can call it the Arkansas River here. When I give this in other states, sometimes I have to call it the Arkansas River. Uh, but in Colorado, we call it the Arkansas River. When I was at Fort Larned in Kansas, I had to change my pronunciation. Uh, find the Arkansas River and travel up and find its headwaters. And then he was supposed to travel south and find the headwaters of the Red River and follow the Red River all the way back to Mississippi and the United States territory. That's going to be problem. That part of the journey is going to become problematic, and we'll talk about that in a second. So um, I also had explicit orders from um, uh, General Wilkinson to stay away from Santa Fe. You know, even in Jefferson's capacious view of the Louisiana Purchase, Santa Fe was still in Spanish territory. And Wilkinson said, we don't want to anger and provoke the Spaniards, so stay away from the seat of their populace. Um, so these are types of official written instructions that we have a uh, record of today. But with Wilkinson, there was always something more. Wilkinson, we'll get to him in a second, but let's go back to Wilkinson for a second. Wilkinson was uh, a schemer uh, of the highest uh, order. He, as you can see from these two quotes, he has not been um, Remembered kindly by history, he's still considered one of the arch roads of the early republic. And since 1787, he had been on the payroll of the Spanish crown, uh, selling geographical and other information, political information, to the Spaniards uh, about the United States uh, government. He also had been involved in the 1790s in a number of schemes to try and foment the secession of Western states and territories from the Union, possibly to form their own new country or possibly to attach themselves to Spanish colonial holdings in North America. So many of the, many at the time uh, and since have speculated that there might be more orders than the ones that were written down that we have uh, a record of, and that possibly Wilkinson gave secret orders to Pike uh, to travel to Santa Fe perhaps to help uh, Wilkinson gain a monopoly on uh, what was expected to be lucrative trade between St. Louis and Santa Fe, or perhaps to spy for a major plot that Wilkinson was involved in with this man. This is Aaron Burser, who was uh, at one time Vice President of the United States and who has had his uh, memory resuscitated by in the last decade by the famous Lynn Manuel Miranda um, uh, musical. In 1805, he had recently killed Anna Alexander Hamilton in a duel, which made, uh, uh, and the fact that he had uh, tried to steal the presidency from, James, from uh, Thomas Jefferson in 1800 
put her in a unique position in the early republic of being equally hated by Hamilton's Federalist and Jefferson's uh, Republican uh, Party. And killing a founding father is not usually a good way to, to advance your political career. And so in 1805, he was looking for something to bring his career back to life, his political and economic fortunes were saved. So he heads west, and it's not exactly clear what he was up to, other than it is certain that James Wilkinson was involved. It's possible that they were trying to uh, precipitate rebellion among western states and territories and create a new nation with, with Burr at the head of it and Wilkinson as his right-hand man. It's more likely that this was a filibustering expedition, uh, an attempt to seize some land in Texas or Louisiana, uh, possibly uh, colonize it and profit from the colonization. The fact that Wilkinson and Burr and Pike were all at Fort Massac on the Ohio River for a brief time, a few weeks in early June of 18, uh, 1805, however, has uh, led many people to suggest that Pike's expedition, which was going to gather geographical reconnaissance of a territory that might have been of great interest to Burr. Um, it's been speculated that perhaps uh, Pike was involved uh, with Burr or perhaps one of other uh, one of Wilkinson's uh, other uh, schemes. Also incriminating is a letter that Pike wrote to Wilkinson in 1806 in which he speculated that if he encountered Spaniards on his journey, he would pretend to be looking for the Red River and to be lost. Whatever Pike's objects were, whether they were Jefferson's or Wilkinson's or Burr, or some combination of them, whatever those objects, something was impelling him forward in the fall of 1806. And on November 15th, a little bit west of uh, Lamar and a little bit southeast of Los Angeles, uh, Pike was at the head of his caravan of 20 men, and he spied through this telescope on the horizon what he described as a clear blue, a small blue cloud. He kept writing and didn't say anything to the rest of his party, but by the afternoon, it, there was no hiding it. It was not a mountain. Uh, it, it was a mountain. It was not a cloud. It was a mountain. Uh, and everybody could see it. And the men paused on the prairie on the banks of the Arkansas River and gave three cheers to the Mexican mountains. And uh, the end of their journey was in sight. In those mountains uh, uh, lay the headwaters of the Arkansas. And from there, they could find the headwaters of the Red, and they would soon be heading home. Now, the next few days in Pike's journal, we very comically. Each morning he wakes up and he looks at the mountains and he says, oh, I think we're going to march to the base today. And at the end of the day, they don't appear to be any closer at all. So what Pike is suffering from here is a very common misconception of Enlightenment era geography. People like Jefferson and uh, James Wilkinson who had deep interest in American geography. Jefferson, interestingly, who was perhaps the most knowledgeable person in the country about Western geography, had never been more than 30 miles west of uh, Monticello in his life. Uh, but he read widely, and he talked to people who had traveled to the west, and he talked to people who had talked to people who had talked to people who had traveled to the west. And um, he and Wilkinson and many others subscribed to a European theory called continental symmetry. And continental symmetry is the idea that what you find on the east side of North America, you're going to find a mirror image on the west side. They knew about the Rocky Mountains generally. Um, they knew that the Ohio River flowed out of the Appalachian Mountains uh, kind of towards the southwest and joined the Mississippi, which bisected the continent. They knew that the Missouri River, they didn't know how far up it started, but they knew that it, had, that it started in the Rocky Mountains and flowed to the southwest and joined the Mississippi not too far from where the Ohio flows in. So you can kind of imagine that this is so, you know, somewhat plausible if you don't have any better, I, any other better information. The problem 
problem is that what this meant was that the Rockies were about the size of the Alleghenies. And so Pike, when he was, he was on the prairie looking at the Rocky Mountains, he thought they were about a third, a third of the size that they actually were. His Ohio Valley mind did not wrap, uh, wrap, his, mind, uh, wrap his mind around the fact that you could see a mountain and still be more than 100 miles away uh, from it. So he continues up uh, the Arkansas River, and after a couple of days, a few days, he comes to this spot, which I imagine that nearly 100% of you in this audience have been to. This is down at um, uh, Runyon, in Runyon Lake, is that what it's called? Runyon Lake um, Park. And it's the, it's the confluence of Fountain Creek and the Arkansas River, and Pike made camp there. Now, his order, Pike was famous, even before he went on this expedition, he was famous for disregarding orders and getting out on his expeditions and saying, oh, I can go even farther, I can do even better, I can do something even more important, and then exceeding what he had been asked to do. His orders did not in any way, shape, or form uh, require mountain climbing. Uh, but he looked up at this uh, peak, and he decided that he wanted to climb it. This is on November 24th. And the reason he wants to climb it is another fallacy of Enlightenment geography called the Heights of Lamb. Again, Jefferson Wilkinson and many others believe that somewhere out west of Louisiana, there was a single height of land. It might be an alpine lake, it might be a single peak, it might be a small range of mountains, but from this height of land flowed all of the great western rivers. And this is important because at the time, imperial powers often claimed new lands based on watersheds. So if you set foot in the Arkansas watershed, you owned all of the watershed. If you set foot in the Missouri River watershed, you own all of the Missouri River watershed. So how many of you have, have been up to the top of Pikes Peak? Have you driven or hiked or on rail? Okay, most of you, it's a pretty nice view from up there, right? Um, Pike thought that he was going to be able to see from the top of Pikes Peak, which he called Grand Peak. He didn't name it for himself. Um, he thought he was going to be able to see the headwaters of the Missouri River and the Yellowstone River, the Black, the Arkansas, the Red, the Rio Grande, the Colorado, and the Columbia. Now, it is a spectacular view from up there. It's not that spectacular, right? Okay. Um, uh, but he sees this as integral to his discovery, his journey of discovery, to be able to gaze on the watersheds of all the great western rivers. So he takes three guys with him, and again, he thinks he's going to walk to the base the next day, and they're going to climb the peak the day after that, and then come back all in one day. Now it's 42 miles as a crow flies to the, the, the top of uh, Pipe's Peak. Needless to say, uh, they don't uh, make it. They spend a couple nights on the plains, and finally, on the morning of the 26th, I think, he camps um, at the base of the mountain, somewhere near Fort Carson, and uh, they cash all of their stuff. They leave their baggage, they leave their um, all of their, most of their food, they eat their blankets, and now I have to tell you a side story that doesn't have to do with Pike's journey, but around uh, my journey. I teach a summer field course where I take students, and we join the Arkansas River down in southeastern Colorado, and we follow it, and we follow Pike's route all the way across Colorado until he leaves at the southern end of the, of the San Luis Valley. So anyway, so one year there's this guy um, named uh, uh, Miles. And uh, we are driving up, we, we go to this spot, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but we get to this spot and we get out of the vans and I, I, I tell the students, um, uh, we've driven part way up into the mountains uh, and I, I told them the story about how I did a lot of the mountains kept uh, cash, all the stuff he had, including his blanket. Miles is an ex-Marine, shaved head, he's several inches taller than I am and several inches wider. He's just this big, um, delightful, enthusiastic guy. And he interrupts me and says, man, never leave your blankets. <laughs> um, uh, and, and I thought that was totally good advice. <laughs> anyway, so um, Miles and I in the class um, follow the Pike's footsteps up to this uh, spot. And there's actually
actually an interesting story. I gather some of you have heard about it in the last uh, few days about controversies over which mountain he climbed and what route he took and things like that. If you're interested, we can talk about that in the Q&A session after, um, uh, after this. But my best guess is that, and I'm basing this, I'm really basing this on what I've learned from other people if I can come up with this. But the best guess seems to be that he got to a point somewhere around here and he has been hiking most of the day by this point. And he has he's lost sight of the peak because he's gotten too close to it. So he can't actually see the grand uh, peak. So he just decides to climb the nearest peak that he can see. This is Mount Rosa. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is I turn my students loose here. At this point, we're bushwhacking. There's no trail. It's national forest land, but there's no trail. So they're climbing through the underbrush and over tree stumps and grabbing onto rocks and moisting themselves up. And I say, I want you to get to the top of that. And so they pick the, what they think is the easiest route. And every single time, without fail, I'm always nervous about this. I've got this, this spot in my GPS so that in case we get lost, but it never happens. They find the cave, a cave, just large enough for uh, three or four grown men to squeeze into and sleep for the night. And Pike says that um, they, on the side of the mountain, before they got to the top, they slept in a small cave. Now, the other thing about this is, so we eat lunch here. I always let the students go ahead of me. They always, and inevitably, about 45 minutes after that last, last spot, they, um, I hear a shout, I found the cave! And then we all gather and we eat lunch around. Um, so then, uh, the next morning, I and his men, uh, they get up and they climb, they get up snow lines, so they're walk, walking in about waist deep snow for the last little bit, and they get up to this, uh, this, uh, I cheated, I did this in June, um, <laughs> I did it on Thanksgiving Day. But he says that the peak was by 15 or 16 miles distant, uh, distant and as high again as we had already ascended. Uh, and he, at that point, he gets up and he decides that seeing the Yellowstone and the Columbia and the Colorado all at once is not worth it. So they turn around, they go back to Pueblo, to their base camp, and they head into the mountains on the day of winter's first blizzard. And this is where the hardship really starts. They travel, they continue up the Arkansas. I know some of you are from uh, Canyon City, so you'll recognize this spot. This is where Great, Great Creek uh, flows into the Arkansas River, just um, a tad west of the central part of and here Pike has another conundrum that he's got to resolve. Um, his maps say that the Red River, remember that he's looking for the Red River, the Red River is to the south or southwest of the Arkansas River. And several forks come together here. And he's wondering which fork is the real Arkansas River, or the real Arkansas River we stand. And um, he sends uh, parties of his men out on reconnaissance expeditions to travel a few hours up each of the different um, uh, tributaries, and he's still not sure which one is the real Arkansas River. Uh, but he sees a trail to the north, which is the opposite direction of what he thinks the Red River is in. But he sees a trail, and he thinks that I need to ask directions, basically. Something on male sort of thing to do, right? Uh, but he's gonna have, he's, he wants to follow somebody. He thinks that maybe he'll encounter someone who can clarify for him the geography that is turning out a lot differently than he uh, thought. So from here, they travel north, which brings them into South Park. He correctly identifies the headwaters of the Black River there, which is like the only thing he gets right in the mountains. This is the two months that he's there. He gets out and right. He crosses to the west out of uh, North Park. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, so uh, I'll tell you about what happens when he crosses to the west. But first, I want to um, tell you about these two maps. The one on your left is a map that is drawn in Pike's handwriting. And we believe that he got this from a trader in St. Louis who he met and who claimed to have been to Santa Fe. Some people had been to Santa Fe across the plains before Pike. Nobody had written it down. We don't have records of who those people are. But Pike says he met a trader in Santa Fe, that he talked to him, and that, and that he, Pike, drew this map as a result. Now, if you look down here, north is to the right. So that means this map is heading west. St. Louis is down here, um, west, excuse me, east, to west.
west. Santa Fe is right there. Here is the Rocky Mountains. And then there's a bunch of rivers flowing out of the Rocky Mountains. Here's the Platte. Here is the Arkansas. And here, uh, kind of short, is the Red River. So if he's here on the Arkansas, he thinks that he's got to go this way to find the Red, but instead he's gone north to join um, the Black. Now this map over here is a map that was published by Alexander von Humboldt, the great Prussian geographer in 1811. But Humboldt, this is based on Humboldt's travels in South America and uh, Mexico. And Humboldt didn't actually cover all of the territory himself that he put on his map, but he talked to people. So he mapped his own travels, but he also, wherever he went, he said, what's on the other side of this mountain? What's the headwaters of this river? And he conjectured another map. And in 1804, on his way back from the Americas, back to Europe, he stopped at the White House. And I would love to have been a fly on that wall, where Jefferson, actually, excuse me. Yes, it's the White House. Um, I would love to have been a fly on the wall and, and, and watch Alexander von Humboldt and Thomas Jefferson have dinner and discuss North American geography. That, that would be like my, my, my dream come true. Anyway, while he was visiting Jefferson, um, Wilkinson arranged to borrow a copy, uh, borrow the map, um, and he secretly made a copy of it himself. And uh, it's likely, we don't know for sure, but it's quite likely that Wilkinson gave a copy of the map to Pike. Now, the significance of this map here is the Arkansas River and, uh, coming out of the Rocky Mountains onto the plains. The significance and Santa, here's, here's uh, Taos, and Santa Fe is just off the map. I didn't did that job probably this, but it's down there. The significance of this map is right here, Rio Rojo de Natchitoches. So the Red River. The Red River, um, lots of people knew about the mouth of the Red River where it flows into the uh, into the Mississippi, and uh, Spanish geographers had just dis had described rivers at a similar latitude that flowed out of the Rocky Mountains. And so what Humboldt did here's here's where the Red River flows into the Mississippi, and Spanish geographers said there's these rivers that flow out of the Rocky Mountains. And what Humboldt did was he connected them. That's going to be a problem. We'll talk about that then. Uh, a second. But this is the geography that Pike has in his head as he's wandering through the mountains. From North Park, he crosses mountains to the west. Oh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll give you a little later. Um, all right, so I can't, um, I can't keep the uh, forward and backward button straight from the pointer. So Pike is right around there right now, the Arkansas River in Colorado. And um, the mouth of the Red River is down here, and the Canadian and Cimarron rivers come out of the Rockies here between the Arkansas and the Red uh, and the Rio Grande, which is right here. Um, but they move back into the Arkansas River, the tributaries of the Arkansas River. And so, what Humboldt has done is he has said that those rivers flow down and become the Red River. The problem is that the Red River is actually Texas. Uh, so Pike is not going to find the Red River by looking in Colorado, but he doesn't know this yet. Um, uh, and in fact, the, the headwaters here are in a very um, geologically broken up and difficult to access area in northwestern Texas and eastern New Mexico, and they wouldn't be uh, definitively pinpointed until 1859, and several other, ge other expeditions, including uh, Stephen Long's expedition in 1820 to Colorado, would uh, fail to find the Red River uh, headwaters as well. So we can perhaps forgive uh, uh, Pike, um, but it's going to cause some problems. All right, so he crosses the um, uh, North Park and goes over Trout Creek Pass, in, and you see the Broad River Valley flowing uh, in front of him again. Uh, this is June, not uh, November, so he's got a lot harder than I do. Um, these are the Collegiate Peaks, and he thinks, uh -huh, I found the Red River. It's supposed to be to the west or southwest of the Arkansas. 
And so the party travels downstream and they have a Christmas dinner and rest um, not too far from modern Salida. And uh, they, they clean their guns and they mend their blankets and their moccasins and things like that and they rest. And then they continue traveling the next day, uh, head, believing that they found the Red River uh, and heading home. And they're in pretty good spirits. They encounter the Royal Gorge, which ignore the train down there. This is the best picture I can find. The Royal Gorge. They have a lot of trouble getting down the Royal Gorge. Uh, horses slip and fall and have to be shot. Uh, they go without uh, being able to find any game, without keep eating uh, much for a while. And then on December 5th, uh, to January 5th, Pike comes out of the Royal Gorge and climbs a little hill and he looks down, and that's what he sees. Um, it's his 28th birthday, and he says that he hopes never to spend another birthday so miserable. He has rediscovered 36 days of hard um, travel in the mountains has yielded, yielded only the rediscovery of the mountain of the same river that he's been following since uh, Arkansas. Uh, excuse me, since October. So if this is the Arkansas again, where is the red? Surely Texas is not one of the places that crossed his mind. Um, uh, Pike has already seen the San Diego Cristo Mountains and decided that they're impossible to cross, but he's pretty sure that the Red River is to the west or southwest of where he is right now. And so he decides that he's going to cross the San Diego Cristo Mountains. Now, here's another, here's another bit of evidence for the secret orders theory. Um, it's a crazy idea to cross the San Diego Cristo Mountains in uh, the dead of winter, and I probably should have just stayed on the plains, so hung out, uh, gone back to Buffalo, or hung out in Kansas City, and uh, wintered there, and then tried uh, later on uh, in uh, the spring. The other thing is that if he has secret orders to get to Santa Fe, Santa Fe is on the other side of the red, as far as uh, Pike knows. So is he crossing the San Diego Cristos because he's looking for the red, which is official orders tell him to do, or is he crossing the San Diego Cristo Mountains to, to get to Santa Fe to spy on Santa Fe, which his conjectured secret orders tell him to do? But because both the red and Santa Fe on this map are in the same direction, the fact that he crosses the San Diego Cristo Mountains don't give us much new information one way or another. He could be going to the red, he could be going to Santa Fe. But Poncho Pass, I think, does give us a clue. Poncho Pass, this is near Salida. This is uh, roughly where Pike uh, spent Christmas Day a few days before. And if Pike wanted to get to Santa so the secret orders theory relies on two things. One, Pike wants to get to Santa Fe. And second, he knows where Santa Fe is, neither of which is certain. But if we assume both of them to be in the affirmative, he wants to get to Santa Fe, and he knows where it is, this is the place to do it. This is the most inviting pass in the northern area of the San Diego de Cristo uh, Mountains. And he, he, he uh, forsook this opportunity on Christmas Day to head south uh, from here through Ponto Pass. One look to his left, I just turned the camera from now on. One look to his left would have shown that Ponto Pass was indeed the place to try and cross the sun rays, because you can see that it would be much harder to do it now. But in any case, in Jan early January, Pike decides that he's going to cross um, the sun ray through the mountains. Uh, he leaves two men, Patrick Smith and Verone Vasquez, uh, and builds a small, uh, what he calls a blockhouse, a small uh, shelter, and he leaves the horses and two men to tend them. The horses are in horrible shape at this point after stumbling down the Royal Gorge and injuring themselves and things like that. Uh, he's going to leave them there. The rest of the party, which is 13 men, are going to put their packs on their backs and they're going to carry only their essentials, what they need for the day. They're going to hunt daily to um, uh, feed themselves so they're not going to carry any food and they're going to find a pass in the sun rays and then they're going to come back and get the horses.
horses and the two men that they left at a blockhouse near Canyon uh, City. So Pike um, uh, heads up Great, Great Creek into the mountains, and he comes out into the wet mountain valley near here uh, late in the day, just before sunset. And he took this picture at the same time of day that Pike was here and nearly the same date of the year. So this is what uh, his view might have looked like. And typically enough, he thinks that the other side of the valley is a lot closer than it actually is. Um, and he, he can see that there's, there's wood and creeks coming out of the mountains, and he sees in front of him, he sees there's not much in the way of firewood, no prospect for hunting game. And so he decides to come across the uh, valley floor to a better place to camp. Turns out to take him several hours longer than they think, and the men get their feet wet crossing the Great Creek. And by the time they get into camp, uh, it is uh, dark, and the men have frostbitten feet, and the um, temperature has dropped to about 10 degrees below zero, and the men are in trouble. This is when he discovers that I, that Sparks and uh, Darty uh, are in no shape to travel. So the party decides to rest here for a few days. Pike goes out and he um, he and one of his companions go out to look for some game the next day. They, uh, they go all, all day and they don't find anything. They're hungry and um, Pike uh, can't bear to go back to the camp and tell his men that there's nothing, there's still nothing to eat. And so he decides um, that he would rather remain absent and die by ourselves rather than um, go back to his poor lads uh, empty handed. So, uh, but the next morning he, um, uh, he gets a shot at a bison and he drags himself over to it. He and his companion pack out some of the meat and they go back to the camp where the party uh, eats for the first time in uh, a few days. But it's evident the Sparks and Darty can't walk. Some of the other men uh, were able to walk, but only with um, uh, sticks as, as crutches. But Pike decides that they have to go on. So they head out, and Pike goes up each one of these. He goes ahead of the rest of the party. He goes up each one of these drainages, looking for a pass to get over the mountains. And each one is blocked uh, by snow. Where is this? This is... Um, uh, in the wet mountain valley at, uh, at the eastern slope of the Sangre de Cristo Mountains. Um, and a blizzard gets, and it gets so bad that they can't see more than a few yards in front of them. The party becomes separated. Uh, they can't find uh, anything to eat. And finally, um, on January 24th, it is too much for Private Brown, and he grumbles. And he says that the uh, burden that Pike is putting on them is fit only for animals. That's his uh, seditious complaint after going days without food um, and trudging through several feet of snow, uh, trying to get over impassable mountains. Uh, but Pike sees this in nationalistic terms, as is kind of his habit. This is not just somebody who's grouching about being tired, it's somebody who uh, is 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 mutinous against uh, the party and thus the United States. But Pike is saved. Pike ignores it during the day. But then he's saved by full balance when they find another bison and they have roasted meat over the campfire that night. And uh, after everybody is rested and well fed, Pike lights into uh, Brown. He accuses him of language which is seditious and mutinous. He says, so think about Declaration of Independence and quality among the individual. Pike is really big, but everybody, including himself, carry equal burdens. And for Brown to complain is a violation of that equality in, um, uh, in the party that's part of Pike's nationalistic understanding. In contrast to Sparks and Darty, who he promised to deliver into the grateful bosom of a grateful country, he accuses Brown of being of uh, in uh, gratitude of shirking his duty to persevere in the uh, face uh, of danger. And he says, for the rest of you, I promise you that 
um, the rewards of the government and the gratitude of your countrymen. So this is the same kind of nationalistic language that implies physical sacrifice on behalf of the country. The pipe is imbibed and bought into, and he's asking uh, it of his men and Brown, including Brown, just as he asked of, um, uh, of uh, Sparks and Darden. Now, Pike is looking pretty uh, bad at this point. He has, he's been, he's consumed with getting over the mountains. He's unwilling to turn back even after pass, after pass is blocked by snow. He alternates this obsession with despair and the desire to just lie down and die. He's abandoned five men. He's pushed others before beyond their limit, and he's threatened to execute anybody uh, who grumbles. So the secret orders theory here sees Pike in these weeks as a man obsessed with getting to Santa Fe and willing to stop at nothing uh, in order to do it. But let's think about Pike. I like to think about Pike as an organism. Okay, he's got a body, and that body needs certain things in order to function uh, well. The men's caloric intake had been dangerously low since the Christmas Eve feast. So they go several days with nothing to eat, and then they gorge themselves when they find food, and then they go several more days with nothing to eat. And they've been doing this for more than a month by this time. The physicians that I talk to in the medical literature that I look at tell me that from these episodic, these episodic feasts, the gastrointestinal systems would not have been able to absorb enough nutrients to replenish the fat um, and muscle that they lost during the extended fast. So on the day that Pike complained, the party had not eaten anything in four days. And Pike described, twice described the men as emaciated in his journals during uh, this time. So it's pretty certain that they are experiencing the first um, uh, the onset of literal, very literal starvation. So weight loss and weakness and apathy and um, uh, uh, irritability, outbursts of violent anger, uh, impaired memory, concentration, and judgment. And you take this along with the apathy that comes with um, uh, hypothermia, and it probably means that Pike and his men, in a very real and literal sense, can't think straight at this point. So Pike's outbursts at, um, uh, at uh, Private Brown and his other strange activities during these weeks um, might be the behavior of a man obsessed with getting to Santa Fe, but they could also be, the, they're also consistent with an organism that is hungry and exhausted and hypothermic um, and has uh, severely impaired um, cognitive uh, abilities. So um, things got better after this incident. They got over the mountains on the 27th, and before them lay another broad river valley with a big river running through uh, the red. Still in Texas. Uh, but I took it for the red, because it's in the spot that he thought the red should be. He travels down past what is now Great Sand Dunes National Park, uh, and then he heads south to a tributary of the river. This is the Rio Conejos, and he builds a stockade. This is a replica stockade built in the 1950s. And um, he settles into wait. He sends the men back into the mountains to look for sparks and Arnie. Before they come back, Pike is met by a party of Spaniards from Santa Fe. And uh, you can see the flagpole there. He has raised the American flag uh, on Spanish soil. And um, they ask him about this curious uh, turn of events. And Pike says, what? Is this not the red? Which is exactly what he had told Wilkinson. Remember, you know, Spaniards find me on their pretend to be looking for the red and to have gotten lost. So his prophecy uh, comes true. The uh, Spanish arrest him. They march him to Santa Fe to meet the to meet the provincial uh, governor. The provincial governor doesn't know what to do with him. He can't very well detain. Uh, he certainly can't execute. 
pipe. The American can't very well detain pipe because Spain and the United States are um, in, uh, at high tensions at this point over the disputes over the Louisiana Purchase that to arrest an American army officer might be cause for uh, a war. And so the governor punts and sends Pike and his party south to his superior, the um, Commandant General of the Internal Provinces of New Spain, to the city of Chihuahua. Um, that guy's name is Manesio Salcedo, and he doesn't know what to do with them. So he punts to and he gets Pike a guided escort across New, uh, uh, across Chihuahua and Texas. So if Pike was looking to spy, he got to see San he got to see San Fe, Chihuahua, and San Antonio. So he got this guided tour of the most populous parts of uh, of New Spain. They eventually just the, deposit him on uh, American soil, and this higher part goes Peter Pan when he sees the American flag uh, wave along. Uh, uh, almost a full year to the day after he originally set out. Now, by conclusion here, let's just return for just a second to the question of national objects and secret orders. So, although it's tantalizing and, and certainly plausible that he has secret orders, the theory ultimately rests on the conjecture that additional evidence exists that we don't actually have. The counter story of Pike as the unenlightened geographer and the imperiled and impaired organism squares not only with all of the available evidence, but it also squares with Pike's character. Remember, Pike's the nationalist. He's committed to physical sacrifice for his country. Conspiring with Berger and Wilkinson do not square with his, his character. But going beyond his orders, doing dangerous things, doing stupid things, when he's exhausted, hungry, um, uh, and, uh, uh, and cold, those aren't necessarily inconsistent with his characters. And if everything could be explained by the evidence that exists, I think historians should be very cautious about conjecturing evidence that doesn't exist, that might exist, that doesn't exist, to come up with an alternative explanation. So his behavior is best explained uh, by this largest set of uh, mistakes and poor decisions that are occasioned by the failure of his resources, uh, his horses, his clothing, his maps, uh, the so his and his soldiers' mind, even their bodies, to do what he required them to do. And that, with this, I will pause, and uh, if anybody would like to ask questions, I'm happy to continue the conversation more <coughs> informally. So I think what we're going to do is Giselle has a microphone, so if you raise your hand, she will bring you the microphone, and then we'll all be able to hear it. Um, when was that portrait that you were showing of him a moment ago? When was that drawn? I'm sorry, when was that what? The portrait that you were showing a moment ago. When was it built? When was the portrait drawn? Oh, the portrait. There was a portrait that was drawn in the last slide. When was he drawn? Yeah, the, the, um, the uh, I think that's about 18, I want to say 1811 or 1812. It's drawn by a very famous um, portrait artist of the early uh, American uh, Republic. So it's after these adventures. I guess it was 1810. Okay. Why <laughs> the 1810 anyway? It's, it's within a year or two of that. Uh, as he was uh, going south in the Wet Mountain Valley, he said that he checked various creeks coming down from the San Diego Cristos. Um, where did he actually pass over the San Diego Cristos? You know? Sure. Um, let me just check. Can everybody hear with the questions, or would you like me to repeat questions? Can you hear fine? Okay. Uh, good. So, um, where did he end up crossing the, the San Diego Cristos? Like a lot of, uh, of pipe. Um, uh, it's not 100% certain. I think there's some partisans who suggest that it's uh, Mosca Pass in, um, 
uh, Rick Sanders National Forest and Rick Sanders National Park and Preserve. I've hiked that with my students, and um, uh, the mouth of that trail comes out into the sand dunes too far south, and it's too short a walk compared to what Kai says. I think the most likely, I think it's generally um, agreed that he crosses over Menno Pass, um, which is a, a much more difficult pass. I actually truck my students up there at Park Ranger Bliss and back with the kid and throw us up there. Um, uh, so we tested that one out in there. Looking at the maps, reading his journal, reading his daily challenge tables, and then um, driving it and talking to rangers, uh, we and I think most other scholars think it's kind of a pass more than likely. Then we've got one over here in the top right. As someone who climbed all the 54 peaks 30 years ago, I find it remarkable that no one uh, specifically talks about altitude sickness. But these fellows, uh, unlike myself, who lived at uh, Denver and uh, above during the week, uh, was pretty well acclimated to 6,000 feet. These guys were flatlanders, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the question of altitude sickness, um, you know, you don't know because if I didn't talk about it, it doesn't mean it didn't happen. A couple of things on that. One is that Lewis was um, very attentive to the health of his men. It's something about a hangnail, we heard about it in Lewis's journal. Pike almost never wrote about his men's health. In fact, the night of the White Mountain Valley when they crossed Great Creek and Speedway, um, his, his description of that is very sparse. Uh, but, and even that is the most that he. Yes, so it's quite possible that there's more altitude sickness than we know about. The other thing is they never got up over Mountain Five. So the top of Mount Rosa is about 11,500 feet. That was the highest that they ever got. So it's conceivable to me that men who had ascended from you know 700 or so feet in the Ohio and Mississippi River Valley, but did it over several months and had spent. Um, a couple of weeks at that five, you know, 4,500, 5,000 feet elevation before the day that they climbed um, Mount Rosa, maybe they could do that without it. too much, um, uh, too much problem with altitude sickness. But it's a great question, and, and we don't really know the answer to it. I can yell. The uh, no, not here. did he name? He didn't name the Peak. So who named it and when? It doesn't sound like it got to the top, and it doesn't sound like you thought about naming it, but you never really got there. Yeah, the question is how did Pikes Peak get its name? So he, he refers to it as the Grand Peak. And um, it was sometimes uh, uh, called Pikes Peak and it was some, uh, by people who came after him uh, because they carried Pikes journals with him as, and his maps as their guide to this territory. So they started calling it Pikes Peak. Now, Edwin James climbed it in 1820 with the Stephen Long expedition. And so others uh, started calling it in the 1820s and 1830s, started calling it James Peak. And it went by both of those names until the late 1830s. But increasingly, Pikes Peak uh, won out. And the Army, uh, Army Corps of Topographical Engineers, which is sort of a predecessor agency to the Army Corps, um, begins to call it um, Pikes Peak in the late 1830s, and then it kind of sticks from there. He never called it Pikes Peak. The guy has a pretty big ego, uh, but uh, not that big. <laughs> uh, back here. So I, I think you covered the course of about a year. And uh, I know I heard no mention or discussion of interactions with uh, Native American tribes. Yeah. Was there any documentation or encounters with Native Americans? Yes. Um, and in fact, the first part, um, so what you got here was chapter five of my book. Chapter four is all about the <laughs> Um His encounters with um, Native peoples took place mostly, up entirely, in the first half of his expedition. 
it was one of the explicit uh, instructions that James Wilkinson gave him. So he was supposed to um, return some Osage captives who had been ransomed by the United States government from the, I want to say, Potawatomi's. Um, uh, and I was supposed to escort them back to their villages in western Missouri. So he did that. And then he was supposed to take some Osages with him and meet up with some uh, Kaw Indians and then uh, take all of them to the Pawnee towns in southern Nebraska and uh, negotiate treaties among the three tribes and then also to convey to all three of them that the United States now owned Louisiana, which is because of a very strange message. <laughs> um, uh, but the purpose of the first part of this expedition was to uh, make friendly relations with the native peoples of the plains. Now, the Pawnees were supposed to lead them to the Comanches. So there's a fourth tribe that he was supposed to develop good relationships with, but the Pawnees refused to accompany him. Um, uh, they wanted to maintain their neutrality between the United States and Spain, so they didn't want anybody to take off the Spaniards who had visited them just a few weeks before um, Pike did. Uh, so Pike is on his own. So he's looking for the Comanches, and he never, on a couple of occasions, he sees somebody off in the distance running out of the beam uh, that may have been a Comanche person, may have been a Pawnee, may have been somebody else. Uh, but he never does find the Comanches. Interestingly, Wilkinson says in a letter to the Secretary of what was then called the Secretary of War, um, Henry Dearborn, Wilkinson says the Comanches reign as the uncontrolled masters of the territory. It's a recognition that you can't travel safely in southern Louisiana, you can't set up forts, you can't trade, you can't prospect for minerals, you can't do anything on the plains and the foothills of the mountains without consent of the Comanches. So Pike's diplomatic mission to um, Native peoples on the plains is um, it's of great import in the eyes of Wilkinson. And Jefferson gave similar instructions to Lewis and Clark. So this was something that was very important to um, the leadership of the early Republic in the United States to start developing good relations because the, the, the possibility of encountering the Sioux or the Comanche or the Cheyennes that bombing them onto reservations and things like that, that's going to come in the future. But men like Jefferson, Wilkinson, and Pike could not imagine doing that because they were at that point militarily and economically inferior, at least when they were on the plains. After this extended journey for uh, a year to get to the peak, how close did he really get? And did he ever try again any other time? He never tried again. Um, he says that it was 15 or 16 miles distant. If Mount Roadside is in fact the peak, it's more like seven or eight dis miles distant. But what, what, what really um, uh, caused him to turn around was the fact that, well, two things. One is, that he would have had to descend a couple thousand feet before going up to Pike's Peak. So there's a valley in between them. It wasn't like he could just walk for seven more miles. The other thing, the reason that he turned around, um, he, he's often, he, he, you can quote him and say that he believed that, uh, he says, under the circumstances, no man should have ascended to his pinnacle. And that's often been taken to be that he was making a prediction that nobody could climb this peak. And really what he's, what's really important there is the under these circumstances. And what were those circumstances? No food, no blankets. Some of them weren't even wearing socks. Um, it's winter time. So he's saying under those circumstances, we can't do this. He turns around um, uh, and decides it's not worth the investment of the energy. And no, he never comes back and never does manage uh, to do it. Now we can drive it. Yes. Going, going back to the end of the expedition, did all of the men return with Pike, but also did any of them ever write anything about Pike, or perhaps hinting 
got those secret orders. Yeah. Um, I, um, I'm very glad you asked that because I kind of left Sparks and Doherty out there in the, the woods that are like doing some food that I want us know. So um, all of the men but one managed to return. So what happened was uh, the rescue party uh, went and found Sparks and Doherty, came back uh, to the um, and then they went on and they grabbed, remember, uh, Vasquez and Patrick Smith were out of Kansas City. So they grabbed them, they bring them back. They also grabbed, like, he doesn't make this talk, but four cute men also got left in the snow at one point. So they grabbed him and they come back to the uh, stockade. And I said, great, go get Sparks and Darty. So then they go back. Before they return, they do get Sparks and Darty, who by this time could travel. But before they return to the stockade, the Spanish have come and arrested by the taking of the Santa Fe. So the two parties moved through Santa Fe and Chihuahua and across Texas um, a few weeks apart from one another. They never reunite, but both of them do make it back uh, to uh, with, uh, U.S. territory. One person, um, I mean, what do you mean, uh, makes it back, but only uh, in the early 1820s. He is returned by Mexico as part, which has gained independence from Spain by this time, as part of the goodwill gesture towards the United States, uh, free political prisoners. The reason Mick was a prisoner is because he shot and killed um, Miller, who, and Miller is the one person who didn't make it happen, it's because he was shot and killed um, in Kaisal, in, uh, in uh, where it's now northern Mexico. Um, what they were disputing is not totally clear. The ostensible reason, and, and we have it was a very long Spanish investigation, and so we have a lot of Spanish language documents that show the investigation. Uh, 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 there may have been disputes over um, Miller's refusal to follow these orders, being with the ranking officer and the um, uh, in the party at this point. Uh, there may be one or more of them who may have been drunk. Uh, there also may be a bit of dispute um, uh, uh, over some money. It's not exactly sure, uh, but he runs the sword through Miller. So Miller dies, doesn't make it back. He stays in prison um, until Mexico returns to as a new well district after the events in 1821. Um, and then you, you also ask, did anyone of them write? Nothing but me that that has survived. And I and many other scholars have worked long and hard for this uh, stuff. Uh, so that means they didn't publish anything. It seems unlikely that they wouldn't have. These guys are these guys are young men from the lower classes of lower ranks of society in the Ohio Valley. So it's possible they weren't very literate or prone to writing. Um, some of them we know could write. Uh, it seems unlikely that they would have, you know, written letters to their loved ones. Hey, I'm back in St. Louis, I'll be home to be, you know, whatever. Um, and you would believe what a jerk that guy was. Or, uh, we, although we do know one thing that happened, and that is that I had led them on a similarly disastrous journey the year before to the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And um, almost all of the men on that expedition signed up for voluntarily for the second expedition uh, to the southwest. So there was at least some level at the outset of the expedition that um, they trusted him, thought he was a good leader, were willing to go on a second expedition with him, even though the first one had been pretty tough. Thank you for um, asking that question. I just like to get to tell what happens to the men. Did Pike not have skilled cartographers or navigators on staff, or were some of their notes confiscated by the captors? Um, all of the above. So uh, he did not have a skilled cartographer. Uh, he, um, uh, most army officers of the day, he was a lieutenant at the beginning of the expedition, he got promoted to captain while he was um, on the uh, journey and eventually ascended to the rank of brigadier general. Uh, before his career was over. Uh, most military officers at the time had at least rudimentary map making skills, and so he was making a map all along the way. 
one of the things that I found out, we got back from the Mississippi trip in April 19 of 06, and he found out about the, um, that he was going to go on the uh, Southwestern trip just a couple of weeks later, and then he departed in July. So you can compare this with Lewis, who had more than a full, had a full year between when Jefferson told him about the trip. And Jefferson sent Lewis to Philadelphia to study with the great urban public physician Benjamin Rush. He sent him to be America's best map makers. He um, uh, sent him to study with naturalists so that he could learn about the animals and plants that he came across. So Lewis was very carefully trained by Jefferson and Jefferson's friends for all the skills he would need on the expedition. Pipes was much more a haphazard. Um, he wasn't adequately supplied. He didn't have the same skills. He didn't have the medical skills that, that, that Lewis did. Um, and cartography, um, he was no, no match for William Clark, who was the, the Corps of Discoveries um, uh, map maker. <clears throat> that said, I did make uh, maps. Um, some of them were confiscated by Spaniards. Uh, he tells a story that seemed maybe a little bit fanciful to me, but um, of, of why some of the, his papers into the barrels of his men's rifles so that the Spaniards wouldn't find them. We also, he also talks about um, pretending to have need to sneak out into the bushes while he was being escorted across the road to Mexico um, and scribbling wildly on pieces of paper that he was able to fill for. Um, uh, while he was complaining of digestion of health. So <clears throat> he comes back in 1809, 1808-1809, he writes his journals. And he writes them with, with quite remarkable precision, more precision than I think he could have um, mustered if he didn't have access to these some of the documents. I don't think somebody's memory would be good enough. And yet, he says things like we marched 20 miles between here and here, and the few places that we can put him on the land, where we can say, we know he's here, we know he's here, and he said, I'll march this far and these he's usually pretty accurate. So it suggests to me that he did manage to have, we don't know how much, but it suggests to me that we do have, that he did have some access to the, to the original or fairly recently copied diaries and I think maybe Ben had a question up here. Thank you. I find it kind of curious under what your comments are. That uh, you were saying that you wrote a letter to Wilkinson saying what he would do if he was uh, if he uh, found the Spanish, how he would basically lie to him. And uh, when we get to the stockade on the Canelos River, uh, and supposedly he's lost, and all of a sudden Dr. Robinson says, well, I'm going to send a video to that, but I'd like you to comment on that if you will. Yeah, sure. Okay, so there's a missing character who has been removed for simplicity, uh, say, that somebody uh, can keep this to about an hour as opposed to two or three. Uh, who's been removed from this, and that is Dr. John Robinson. Dr. John Robinson is um, an acquaintance of uh, uh, Wilkinson, and Wilkinson, uh, sort of at the last minute, attaches him to Pike's expedition. Uh, Robinson is not a military uh, officer. He is uh, a very widely read and literate uh, man, and he, um, he is the source of, of what little medical care that they have on the expedition. When they get to this, when they build the stockade, um, and they're in San Luis Valley, um, Robertson says, I'm going to go visit Santa Fe. Um, he claims to have a debt that he wants to collect, that someone who owed him money back in St. Louis has gone to Santa Fe and either been taken prisoner there, as sometimes happens to people, or has pulled up there so that he doesn't have to pay the debt. And Robinson ostensibly is going to collect uh, this debt from the, the Santa Fe trader that he uh, owes him. Um, this is another piece of evidence in favor of the secret orders theory 
that uh, that John Thomas said, with or without Pike's knowledge, um, uh, is actually what this is necessary. So uh, it's not, it, it may or may not be Pike who has these secret orders. Pike may know about them or maybe he's oblivious to them, but it's Wilkinson. And so when they get to um, the San Luis Valley, Wilkinson says, we're not Wilkinson, uh, John Robert. <laughs> um, uh, uh, John Robinson says, this is the closest we're going to get Santa Fe, I'm going to go with Perry, I'm going to go with Wilkinson, has told me, and I'm going to use this death thing as uh, a ruse. Um, certainly quite possible, like the rest of it, we don't have documents that really support this, um, but it is highly curious that Robinson is suddenly going to take on uh, for Santa Fe. But one of the things, though, that makes me fairly confident that Pike is in the dark about this, and that Pike says, what, is this not the red? He's telling the truth. Is the fact that if, if Robinson and Pike know they're in Santa Fe, the best way to get to Santa Fe is to go down the Rio Grande, which they're camp on, just head straight south. But Robinson doesn't do that. He heads west into the San Juan Mountains. Um, he eventually does get to Santa Fe, and that's actually not a bad way to get to Santa Fe because the Santa Fe River Board is so difficult to navigate um, in the northern part of, of New Mexico. But there's no way for Pike and Robinson to have known that. So if Pike and Robinson believe that they are on the Red River, the logical direction for, for Robinson to head out is west, not south. If they know that they are on the Rio Grande, the logical way to get to Santa Fe is for him to head south. So the fact that he heads west I think is not definitive, but it, it, it's fairly strong evidence that they really believed that they were on the red at that point. Now, what that means about secret things that, that Wilkinson might have said to Pike or, or, or Robinson, we don't, I don't think we'd say definitively that that's the case, but we certainly, uh, certainly it's possible. Just yes. briefly, this Coombs to be something I've thought about many times. Heard the story. You know, really though, uh, it seems to me the, the the story, the lie that I was really looking for the Red River, and and I got lost. That's actually not necessarily in any evidence of a secret plan. It's a pretty good way of getting out of a bind if you have to get. Which, which and they always knew they might be caught by the Spaniards, and so to have an agreement with your commander Wilkinson that this is the story in, in case he has to back him up. It seems to me a more plausible explanation of that is that, hey, it's a good, it's a good way of getting out of the jam if I happen to get them. Yeah. And, and everybody knows that that's going to be the story that we're going to tell. So that's, that's, that's a very reasonable, that's why, why, why he writes the letter. One more question. No more questions. <laughs>